Hello and welcome back to Av Imperator Productions. Today we're going to be taking a look at Ancient Rome, their take on aesthetics and art. We are going to have to expand our definition of what art exactly is and kind of go outside of the umbrella of what we today call fine arts because there was a lot of innovation and techne and other skills that were at play in ancient Rome, but they didn't have as much of a grip or an attraction towards uh, art as we see it today in ancient Roman times. This was mostly because they had a very difficult world to contend with, they had a lot going on, they had all kinds of war and plague and famine and insurrection. If you want to know more about society and how the politics and the people work together, go check out my episode 4 on Ancient Rome video. This is going to go a little bit more into their art, and especially their architecture and their oratory. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look. Today, we're going to talk about Ancient Rome and their view on art. Although Ancient Rome was located very close to Ancient Greece, in the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of ideas spread between the two. The way that the Roman military originally marched had a lot of spear infantry that looked a lot like the phalanx, so there was definitely some contact. Greece had southern Italy, which they called Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece, and there was definitely a cultural influence, but the Romans, for the most part, didn't want a whole lot of what the Greeks actually had to offer. They didn't like the concepts of thinking about abstract thoughts, they didn't like spending time and resources on ideas that may not even exist or have no real utility in their everyday life. So for a lot of the early Roman period, there wasn't a lot of carryover from Greece, especially in their art. The ancient Romans themselves, uh, we're talking before imperial times, before really the Second Punic War, the 3rd century BC. They had very little art. Most of their painting was done directly onto pieces of wood or log. Uh, a lot of rich people's walls might be painted. But most of their artistic focus was more on construction, war, and agriculture. We'll go a little bit more in detail on these in a little bit, but I want to briefly go over why construction, war, and agriculture could take a lot of artistic influence that we might not think of at first. The war side is kind of interesting to look at, um, mostly because when we think of these ancient times they had large cities and these large cities had walls. When uh, Caesar, well yeah, when Julius Caesar was invading uh, Gaul in his campaigns right before becoming emperor, his soldiers would often have to construct earthen ramparts, which means that they would build these big ramps that led to the top of the walls, siege engines. If you're firing a ballista, it's not really a simple matter of putting the bolt in it and cranking it and just letting it go. You really have to know where you're aiming, what you're trying to hit, how far away it is, how the projectile angles through the air. There's a lot of really precise calculations, and at this time they didn't have the calculus that Napoleon would be using to fire his cannons later, so it was a much more artistic concept. The idea of using art for war may sound a little strange, but war was really the staple of the early Roman society, and anything that was useful to the Romans had to be useful in war. The Romans also didn't treat their artists all that well. Orators could become senators and could become fairly high in society, but the average newsreader, the average play uh, writer, the average actor, they were all seen as very low. They thought that they gave very little to society, and so society should give very little back to them. 
these concepts would kind of come into conflict uh, with the power structures a little bit later. Um, Nero himself was an actor, which was a huge scandal in his day. But most of the innovation in art came through construction with their use of concrete, which is actually very similar to the concrete that we use today. In fact, some would even say maybe a little bit better. We'll look at that later. Their war engineering, their war machines, and their war engines, these were the real areas of artistic innovation in ancient Rome. So how did Rome get from the point of being a sort of low art society to generating the masterpieces and works of art that we know them for today? It took a long time and it took a lot of war, obviously. After the Second Punic War, Rome had few rivals that could really challenge and destroy her. and a sort of looking inward began. They did continue to expand outward, but their main wars between the, form the formation of the Empire and the Punic Wars were social wars and civil wars. They focused a lot more internally and on their own development and the development of their society. This can be seen with new ideas and concepts coming to the forefront, even if they were from foreign territories, they began to mesh with the Roman style. This is where it will be important to have seen the previous video, because I'm going to go over some terms that I've discussed in further detail in episode 4. I'm just going to briefly touch on them here. Um, those being Gravitas, Pietas, Constantia, and Cultus. These were four basic Roman concepts that were very important to the development of a proper Roman citizen. There was lots of different ways to go about getting these, but one of the best ways would be an ideology, or joining the military, or joining the civil office. As Greek learning began to trickle into Rome and greater society at large in the world, there were few that meshed perfectly with Roman society, and these were quickly absorbed into their own culture. One of these ideas was Stoicism. You may have heard of Stoicism before, I'm going to try and go over it fairly briefly to explain the idea and give a little bit of an example of how it would have worked. So Stoicism is essentially saying that virtue, virtue meaning the highest good, is knowledge. Stoicism holds that the highest good that exists is knowledge. Everything else is very sort of trivial. The wise man, the man who has knowledge, lives in harmony with providence and nature becoming indifferent to fortune, pleasure, and pain. Now, becoming indifferent doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have any effect on you, because it does. Becoming indifferent means more accepting and understanding that if something is a certain way, then that's the way reality works, and that's what you have to deal with. This is very different from today's society, obviously. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities with this thought would be the development of gravitas, which is your ability to affect a room uh, and affect the way that people stand, the way that they see you. So when you walk into a room, someone with high gravitas will, even if it's a loud and crowded room, will be observed coming in. Usually people with gravitas are people that are stable, people that are strong. Pietas, your ability to connect with your roots and to properly uh, show religious conviction, not necessarily in the way of a religion strictly, but in doing something repeatedly and correctly. Constantia, your ability to grab onto an idea and not let go for a long period of time. And cultus, your ability to be cultured and to understand culture. All of these concepts could be further developed with Stoicism and with the acceptance of knowledge as the highest good. Now, I want to give an example of how a Stoic would look at a problem that we look at today and how they would have prescribed a better solution than maybe what we use. There was a great speaker and orator, Cicero. He was a senator, he was also a consul, he had to make a lot of tough decisions, he wrote a lot of fantastic books. In fact, 1% of the overall books that he wrote exist today, and in that 1%, every word in the old Latin language exists, as far as we know. 
they used to teach Latin based off of the works of Cicero, because by the time you've read all of his works, you've literally read every word in the Latin language. Very interesting guy. Cicero had a book as he got older, and it was On Growing Old, I believe is the rough translation. And basically, this book explained the transition of an adult male from productive, reproductive, to non-reproductive as you grow older. And Cicero looked at this with indifference, but it still changed, right? So Cicero understood that as you get older, your sex drive goes down, and instead of trying to bring it back, instead of trying to grow the hair back out of the top of his head again, he accepted it and he tried to find a structured way to live his life that made this new setting, this new reality more palpable. He explained that through devotion to small tasks and educating the populace and reproducing your knowledge for the masses, you could get more satisfaction out of cultivating your garden and cultivating the minds of others than a man trying to cultivate a baby inside of a woman. So the indifference still necessitates a bit of a change, but it's also accepting of reality. Today, when someone gets to that age, 65 or so, instead of telling them it's time to refocus on new topics and to give back to your society, we tell them, take a pill. That's a topic for another time. I'll let you decide which one you think is better and which one could be more beneficial to their society at large. So, as these new ideas came sweeping in, as Stoicism began to take hold in the aristocratic upper classes and spread out from there, the arts began to came into full effect and to sweep over the landscape of the society of Rome. Previously, especially visual art, was very minimal. If you ever did see a painting, it might just be on a piece of wood. Uh, some rich people might have their walls painted, I mentioned that a little bit, that was a very common thing in ancient Rome. And the funny fact about that, when they did paint their walls inside of the city, they would paint it to look like they were outside in the wilderness, and then the windows would actually give them a look into reality. So it was kind of interesting that they chose to have these houses right in the center of the city and paint it as if they were in the middle of nowhere, which would have been possible to do at the time anyways, but that's a topic for another video. Their sculpture was very few and far between, and when they did produce sculpture, it was small in scale and not quite up to the same, the same standards of techne and mimesis that the Greeks had used previously. They had a very minimalistic aesthetic. There's nothing wrong with minimalism, except when your large empire expanding and your minimalism is simply because of your focus on war and agriculture as opposed to any sort of deliberate thought into the process. It becomes a little more interesting that they could go so long without truly developing this kind of idea. The Romans did differentiate themselves from the Greeks and from other builders by making their buildings a little bit different. When we see Greek temples, they have columns, they're very open, you could enter the temple from any side. Romans are different. They do still have the columns, but they have an enclosed inner sanctum. You can only enter from one angle. This is one of the major differences. It's not a huge difference, but it does start to become more and more important as their architecture diverges. As more contact with the Greeks is established in Rome, their culture and their ideas begin to take a heavy root in the Roman society. Most people still saw Greek practice as barbaric. Greeks were bearded where Romans were not a person who dedicated themselves to Greek culture, would have been accepted in circles that were accepting of Greeks, but overall the Latins didn't really like anyone else at all. The language barrier, the fact that the Greeks had a much more lofty sort of mindset, put up a lot of walls between the basic Roman citizen and the Greek philosopher of old. Fortunately, this 
trickle down of knowledge from the upper classes who first discovered and reworked these ideas into Roman society as it came down to the average plebe began to really change the way that people saw things and change the way that the society was built in itself. The Roman visual arts were not as focused as the Greeks. When we do look at these sculptures, they don't have exact proportions. It's more about conveying the emotion than it is about conveying the reality. The Greeks were very into portraying reality above everything else. The Romans were more into utility. Utility being the usefulness of an object. So if that object was supposed to elicit an emotion, that was more important than the object looking anatomical. The two coming together at once would have just been a little bit much, especially early on, for the Romans. Their concepts, the Greek concepts of mimesis and techne, were not necessarily carried over into Roman society until maybe a little bit later, and the striving for the mapping of the human body didn't really come to the forefront of Roman understanding until about the Empire stage. Once these ideas did come into play, however, they became huge and they were widely accepted and spread. The Romans, as I've stated before, were more of an innovating society in that they were more concerned with finding ideas that worked and refining them over coming up with new ideas and testing them and putting them out to use. The Roman society was very good at this and it would use lots of ideas from lots of people to make their own society stronger. So I want to look a little bit at how the Romans responded to finding the Greek art and its aesthetic and how they tried to bring that back to the Roman side. There were a lot of artists in ancient Rome, uh, especially leading up to the time of the Empire, the 2nd, 1st century BC, that they meant on these large pilgrimages to Greece. They wanted to see how these sculptures worked, what their significance was, how it made them feel, how the technical artists had put them together. They really wanted to know more, and they really wanted to know just how all of this worked. This led to a very fascinating period where, so the, the ancient Greeks, they mostly actually did their sculpture in bronze. Most of the time when we see these marble statues, they're not Greek, they're actually Roman copies. The way that the Roman artists first got into the Greek art was by simply copying everything that they could find. This was for several reasons. This made the artist, uh, it gave the artist more techne, as the Greeks would have understood it, by copying a masterpiece that was already regarded to have high mimesis. It also allowed these pieces to be spread further than they originally were. If there was one great work versus ten, fewer people could see it. And a lot of these bronze statues were lost or destroyed or melted down, so redoing them in marble gave them new life and allowed them to continue to exist beyond their original shelf date, if you will. One of these pieces that I really want to look at is called Lyokun and His Sons. This is a story of a priest named Lyokun, priest of Poseidon. He, his story comes from the Iliad. And here's the thing about the Iliad. The Iliad is essentially the ancient Greek Bible. If you were to go back and to go to the Library of Alexandria before it was destroyed, chances are 90% of the text would have been referring to the Iliad in a similar way that if you go to the medieval period in Christian Europe and you went to one of their libraries, 90% of those texts would have been in reference to the Christian Bible. The stories of the Iliad were what it meant to be Greek and they were huge explanations to how a citizen should act, what fate is, how nature responds, the imposition of reality onto the person regardless of their stature. These kinds of topics are all thoroughly addressed. The story of Lyokun is very interesting. He was a priest of Poseidon 
and he was in Troy when it was under siege. He saw the Trojan horse coming in. There's a few different ways that the story is told. It's not actually in the Iliad. It's added in later, or maybe it was part of it originally, but was lost. We're not entirely sure. But he saw the Trojan horse coming in, and he thought it was fake. So he took his spear, and he threw it right at the horse, stuck it in the side, and someone murmured or something happened inside. But at the same time, Poseidon sent his kraken, this big nasty octopus, to the beach to eat Lyokun and his two sons. So this statue is that moment when him and his sons are being consumed by the beast. If you believe that telling of the story, then the lesson is that he was given suffering and pain for doing the right thing and for being correct. There's another story that he didn't actually hit the Trojan horse and that he was wrong on something. There's a few different interpretations. This is the most understandable one that I could find. So he was punished for being correct and for trying to use the truth against the plans of the gods. Which is interesting because Ulysses would later be condemned by the same god Poseidon who killed one of his own priests to make sure that Ulysses was successful. It's all very complex. It takes a lot of thought. It's a great uh, thing to think about if you get the time. But essentially, Lyokun was given suffering with no reward. A lot of the older stories from these ancient times, if there was a character suffering, he had either earned it or he was suffering because something was about to happen that was a payoff. This picture of Lyokun is one of the first examples of suffering just existing, just as it does in reality. That, in addition to the beauty of the stone, you'll see very few supports. This is a very anatomically correct piece. It was unburied about 500 years ago and had very little damage done to it. It shows the expertise of the Greeks at the time who had cast the original statue, and it shows the ability of the Romans and their copy artists to be able to reproduce not only the terrifying emotions present, but also the masterful skill that it takes to produce something out of stone.